The Mac Observers, Mac Geek Cab, episode 767. 767? Wait, backwards. 767 for Monday, June 24th, 2019. <laughs> Folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where you send in your tips, your questions, your cool stuff found. We take all that stuff, we mix it together, we jumble it up, and then we sort it out, we sift through it. And the idea is all of us, every one of us, by answering your questions or listening to the answers to your questions, by sharing your cool stuff found or hearing cool stuff found shared. Same goes with quick tips. The goal is for each and every one of us to learn at least five new things. Every time we get together sponsors for this episode include Linode or Linode, depending on your choice of pronunciation, it doesn't matter. You go to L I N O D E.com slash M G G or other world computing at maxsales.com or experian.com slash mgg or linkedin.com slash mgg we'll talk about why you want to go to all of those links shortly but here where i should be sitting next to pilot pete because it's episode 767 and that's what he flies but he's actually busy actually doing some family stuff today so he couldn't make it here in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton and here in fearful connecticut this is John of Braun. How you doing today, Mr. John of Braun? Eh. Just eh? Come on, we get to do a show. This is like as good as it gets. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, how lucky are we? <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. All right. So we have some tips and all kinds of crazy stuff. Why won't that behave? You know, I, I hate it when my computer won't behave. And, uh, and, you know, maybe that's the, the whole point of this, uh, you know, that there you go. Maybe that's what it is. All right. Uh, but we have some quick tips that hopefully will help our computers behave better. Petter sends in one and says, when adding an event to the calendar in iOS, your date and time picker might be either in one minute or five minute intervals. Mine was for years set to five minutes, which bothered me because I wanted to add some more precise calendar events like train or bus or plane schedules. Then I discovered that if you double tap on the minute selector, it will actually change this view. Now I finally can hyper schedule everything. And he's right. Yeah, I just tap on the selector and it changes from five to, to, to or five minute increments to one minute increments. I had no idea about that. Did you, John? No. I know. This is what we love about uh, doing the show is we all get to learn. We get to make our computers work better. You know, our iPhones are computers for the at least for the sake of argument in this show. We could have a, a, a larger conversation where I would also argue that point. But but for the sake of this show, it's not an argument. It's just an easy way to classify things. So. All right. So that was from Petter. The next quick tip is from Peter, but it's actually from uh, he, he noted that uh, Craig Federighi at the John Gruber's talk show shared another quick tip. He said uh, on the iPhone 10, 10 S, 10 R, I've brought up the app switcher by dragging up and then right uh, when and then the apps fan out. So there's that one motion up and right. You scroll and select the one you want. Craig showed probably the standard way. Just drag left or right on the bar at the bottom of the screen to go one app at a time. He said, I had no idea about this. He says, so I guess this is a dual quick tip for whichever one you didn't already know. Yeah. And, and you're totally right, Peter. Right. So you can bring up the app switcher by swiping up and, and going right. Kind of a little uh, right angle. Uh, thing if you will and you do you draw that little curve and then boom the app switcher comes up but if you just want to switch to the previous app or the the next app in the queue just grab the little bar at the bottom on the on the buttonless iphones and uh, and you can swipe around and get right to where you want to go and this works on the buttonless ipads too but uh 
Yeah, it, it's pretty handy. The, the one weird part is that the order changes. So let's say I'm in uh, mail and I go to Safari. If I spend any amount of time in Safari, you know, if I let's say Safari was the previous app that I used. So I'm in mail. I swipe that little bar to the right, meaning I'm moving to the left. Right. So I'm swiping mail off to the right. Now I'm in Safari. I do some stuff in Safari. My feeling would be that I could swipe left and get back to mail. No, no. Now that I've spent time in Safari, that's the frontmost app. So now I have to go left to get to mail. It's a little bit wonky in that regard. I'm not sure why Apple thinks that that's how it should work, but yet that is how it works. So uh, so the app that you just spent any amount of time in will be the rightmost app in that list. So you always, almost always have to go left to get to other apps. But yeah, thanks, Peter. That's great. Cool stuff. All right. Yeah. Any thoughts on these, John? I like my button. Don't take my button away. Oh, no, your button's gone. <laughs> your next iPhone won't have a button. Uh, nor will your, ne your next iPad. And I have to say, it really isn't. Um, it, it, I, it is progress that I am happy to be a part of. It, it's, it's really not. Um, it's not bad. I, I think you some people, depending on how you use the device, would complain more about the lack of a headphone jack than the lack of a button. But um, functionally, not having a button is actually quite fantastic. It, it's it really is. It's not a it's not a bad change to make. It is change. And I grok that. But it is not a bad change to make. So don't fear the lack of a button. There's there's something in there about a Reaper. But mm -hmm. I don't know how to get there from here so we will go to paul because i know how to get there from here paul says i wanted to share a cool stuff found that i only recently discovered uh, which was news to the folks at my local apple store so i thought it might be useful for some of our listeners i have been for some time trying to find ways to change my workflow to allow me to carry only an ipad however it was constantly blocked by one particular app i'm a consultant in the uk who normally works with big banks this means I must use Windows on their desktop machines through terminals if I'm in the office or through the Citrix client on my Mac or iPad. The problem with the iPad version is that if you don't have a mouse uh, or that you don't have a mouse, given that you are winning, using a Windows environment, this is quite clumsy at best and downright impossible at work at worst. I've been chatting with the business team at the Edinburgh Apple store for quite some time to try and find a solution. Finally, a couple of weeks ago, I happened across a forum thread full of others with the same problem. And I found a link to uh, a mouse that works with the Citrix app on iPad and presumably on iPhone. He says, though, uh, I don't expect that experience would be all that pleasant. I could go with that. Yeah. And uh, he says uh, it's a little on the expensive side for a thing that only works with one app. He says it's about 95 pounds. So you looks like you can get it in the U S for 60 to U S dollars. But uh, if you are like me and must use a windows environment through Citrix for most of your working day and only want to carry an iPad, this is awesome. He says, I know mouse support is coming in iPad OS uh, 13, but given what I have read and seen, the mouse is pretty much replicating the touch interface. So this little device might still be quite valuable. Yeah, pretty cool. We'll put a link to it. It's called the Citrix X1 mouse. So there you go. That's the uh, that's what it is. Pretty good. I like it. Pretty good. Cool. Any thoughts on that, Mr. Braun, before we move on? I don't think I don't think I've used anything Citrix for quite a while. So uh, looking at them here. Oh, yeah. Virtualization, applications, server, networking. Yeah, they do a little of everything. Cloud, software as a service. Huh. Yeah. No, Citrix I use for their um, their go to meeting all the time with with people. That works quite well, um, you know, because you get the, the full web, uh, you know, mm -hmm. camera interface and everything like that. Yeah, it's great for meetings. OK. Uh, all right. Moving on, uh, we might as well stay in Cool Stuff Foundland here. Dennis has uh, a follow-up to the Cool Stuff Found that mentioned to right-click on the Safari Plus button to access recently closed tabs. He says a very cool utility for Chrome and Fire Firefox is OneTab. 
that allows us to save all open tabs before closing the browser. It does that as a list in a new tab. What makes it very powerful is that you can then organize that list of links in various ways, grouping of links, drag and drop, sorting of links. And since it's a browser plugin, it works cross platform. Very cool. Thank you for that, Dennis. I like that. Good stuff, man. Pretty good. This is what we love about cool stuff found. It, it always bugs me when I'm using Firefox where it's like, hey, you're going to lose all your stuff when you quit. It's like, no, save all my stuff when I quit. I want you to save my stuff. So this, uh, there you go. Puts it all in one tab. Let's you organize it. Pretty good, huh? You use Firefox or Chrome for anything, John? Uh, usually if something doesn't work in uh, Safari, I'll then go to Firefox. And then lastly, I'll go to Chrome. <clears throat> oh, or if really? I need, uh, interesting. Or if I need to run some flash stuff. Sure. Sure. I, I do um, the one that, uh, Oh, good. I do it through Chrome. Right. Right. I, uh, we have found for the, we use Google Hangouts for a lot of stuff here at, uh, Mac Observer. And especially we use it for a daily meeting because it's an easy way to get everybody together on video and we can see each other and chit chat, uh, briefly and then, you know, go on with our day. And, uh, while it, appears as those hangouts works fine in safari and perhaps firefox uh, one issue that has happened routinely in safari as of late is that some if you are using safari you will not necessarily hear all of the other participants you will hear some of them but not all of them uh, so we found that for Hangouts, way better to standardize on Chrome, which makes sense. I mean, it's a Google product. So whatever little tweaks and changes they're going to make are going to be reflected in their browser. So we use Google. Hang we use Chrome for Hangouts. It's way easier. And it's cool because I can just put the links to the Hangouts right in the Chrome taskbar and it makes life way simpler. So good, good. Um, I've had, well, uh, I, so. I've got a couple of cool stuff's found, John. One is um, Kanex, K-A-N-E-X, has some very cool, what they call DuraBraid cables, which are these uh, braided cables for a variety of purposes, uh, different purposes. Easy for me to say. The, the cool ones that I have found lately are they have audio cables. So either Lightning or USB-C, two separate cables, to the you know mini eight audio stereo like aux in is what we would call that so if your car doesn't do bluetooth or anything like that or you you just need to use aux in regularly this lightning to aux cable saves you from having to use like different adapters and anything like that it's just one thing boom plug it in good to go and it's a it's a sturdy cable with this durabraid stuff so i've been very very happy about those and uh, and they work quite well. So I'll put a link to those in the show notes, but that's pretty cool to have a single cable to go to an aux port kind of feels like the old days, which makes life way easier. So just good. It won't charge, of course. So bear that in mind. But, you know, you get data or audio, not data, just audio. Sometimes that's all you need. Thoughts on that, John? All right. There he is, Mr. Braun. OK, um, <laughs> John, you and I were at Pepcom the other night and we saw actually lots and lots of different cool things. Uh, Pepcom just being an event that uh, it's essentially speed dating for the press is, is what it is. Companies will just set up a bunch of booth. A bunch of companies will each set up a table, no booths. And uh, and you just run around and, and the only attendees are press and makes life really easy and super efficient. And we saw lots of cool stuff. Some of it isn't available yet. Um, so we won't mention any of the stuff that's not available. Uh, I don't think it's secret. It's just that I don't want to frustrate you by telling you about something that you can't just click on and go and get if it interests you. So, uh, so we will save those for a future week when they are available and, and then we'll tell you cause there's some cool stuff, but, uh, the, the one that is available is, uh, from my charge, they've got, and they've had for a while their wireless uh, charging power bank, right, where it's got a chi pad on it. But this one is the wireless, my, the MyCharge Unplugged Dual 10K. So it's a 10K power bank 
It's got a chi pad on it, so you can put your phone right on the bank. And the, the size of the bank, it's a little thicker than your phone, but it's about the same dimensions as your phone. So you could hold the two together if you needed to, say, make a call while your phone was charging this way. And then it's also got two USB-A ports on the bottom of it for output power. So uh, lots of cool options with this, including, you know, if you charge this up uh, on your hotel in, you know, in your hotel room during the day, then you could just put this next to your bed. You don't have to fight for a plug behind the table and all that stuff. You just put your phone on top of it, charge it. It's got 10,000 milliamp hours. So that'll charge your phone probably four, maybe five times. And then you could plug in like your watch cable into the one of the USB ports and you're good to go. What makes this dual is that it also has a Qi coil on the bottom of it to charge from. So you don't even have to plug it into charge and it will do pass through charging, too. So if you've got a Qi pad, you put the charge, you put this, you know, uh, power brick on it, uh, whatever you want to call it, this battery on it. And then you put your phone on top of that and make a little sandwich and it'll charge your phone first and then charge the uh, the battery next. So it's all very cool and makes life pretty easy. And it's 60 bucks on Amazon. So we'll put a link to that. Pretty good. But that's the unplugged dual. Just bear that in mind because there are many of they have like the unplugged, uh, which looks very similar, but won't charge via Qi. And maybe that doesn't matter for you. And then you could get one of the other ones. But there you go. So pretty good, huh, John? I like it. Uh, same. <clears throat> yeah. Th- thoughts to share? Yeah, I've noticed some uh, some phone vendors have been advertising the ability to use your phone to charge someone else's. Uh, like via, Samsung has some do that. Via Qi, or is it just with a cable? I think it's Qi, yeah. Oh, really? That's interesting. Huh. Yeah, you probably skipped all those commercials. But no, I've seen it. So, you know, somebody's like, oh, I need a charge. And it's like, oh, okay, put your phone on top of my phone. Ah, that's pretty good. Huh. Why not? Right? It's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Good. Good, good. Where are we on time here? We have time for, uh, yeah, we can. Oh, actually, we've got some great questions to go to. The first thing I want to do, though, is... uh, talk about our our first two sponsors if that's okay by you mr braun of course all right listen your credit score is something that up until now you have not been able to control on your own well experian boost changes that you go to experian.com slash mgg that's e-x-p-e-r-i-a-n dot com slash mgg and they will let you link All the bills that you pay with your bank account. So whatever that is, water, gas, electric, cable, cell phone, you link them all up and instantly and for free. Did I mention that this is free? Yeah. Experian.com slash MGG will instantly, once you link it all up, show you exactly how this is going to impact your credit score. Chances are it's going to be a positive impact. And you say, cool, go. And then, boom, your credit score has increased because of this. For the first time ever, you get to be in control of something positive that can happen instantly to your credit report. Man, look, this is John and I, when we're not here talking about all your questions and all this stuff. One of our favorite topics is our credit scores. Really, like since we were, you know, whatever, college age kids in our 20s. We have been obsessed with our credit scores and we talk about this all the time. And finally, Experian has done something that allows you to be in control of this part of it. And it's free. I know. Experian.com slash MGG. Go there now. Game changer. I'm stoked that they're doing it and I'm stoked that they're a sponsor. Our thanks to Experian for sponsoring this episode. Hey, business owners, I know you're out there. We've got a lot of you folks that are running your own consulting businesses. We've got a lot of folks that are running all kinds of businesses and we're answering your questions. That's great. One question that we don't really answer here is how do you find good people? Well, now I have an answer for you, and that's through our sponsor, LinkedIn Jobs at LinkedIn.com slash MGG. That's where you can go to get $50 off your first job post. Now, why LinkedIn? LinkedIn. 
Well, you know me. I'm a big fan of what I like to call the unfair competitive advantage. You know what unfair competitive advantage LinkedIn has over every other job board? LinkedIn has everyone there, even if they're not looking for a job, right? Because we're all on LinkedIn all the time, you know, posting our updates. We post our MGG episodes there. People are updating their profiles, keeping their skills in line. Yeah, all the things that you need to know if you want to hire someone. So LinkedIn can work to match you with candidates that are perfect for the position and your company. and. Sometimes, in fact, more often than sometimes, I would say more often than not, the right person for your job is not necessarily someone that's out there looking for a job. Well, LinkedIn's got them. More than 610 million members visit LinkedIn to make connections, learn and grow as professionals and discover new job opportunities. You've got to check this out. I have used this and it works. And you can get $50 off your first job post. Like I said, go to linkedin.com slash M G G terms and conditions apply as always, but you've got to check this out. Go to linkedin.com slash M G G or thanks to LinkedIn jobs for sponsoring this episode. All right, let us go to James. Take me to James. John. All right. James says <laughs> that he's running out of space and he's not sure what his best path for forward is. So he has an iMac whose internal SSD goes mostly unused because his photos library is on an external two terabyte SSD RAID zero array, which is now running out of space. Additionally, has a time machine drive, just a regular four terabyte hard drive, but it's constantly full, very noisy, and may also be too small to back up the iMac and external photos SSD. To my mind, the simplest solution to the storage problem is to get a bigger like-for-like -like drives to replace the current one. This involves a lot of work, will probably need to be repeated every, every now and then. And at the end of each of those cycles, I'll have documented but perfectly functional drives to get rid of. Decommissioned, sorry. Um, it feels inelegant and wasteful. My ideal solution would be a hard drive array that allows for multiple volumes incorporating both time machine and photo volumes, which can both be dynamically resized simply by popping in new SSDs. Is this a thing? If not, maybe two separate drive arrays, one for photos and one for time machine, be an option. I haven't heard good things about Drobo recently, but it's all I can think of that seems like it might fit the bill. If I were to plot my priorities on a project manager's squared, I'd want the external... Oh, man, there's a line break there. I can't read this. To be fast, SSD uh, or Thunderbolt. Uh, I think that's just that line there. Uh, and expandable. Uh, it would be fine giving up on cost to make those things happen. As for the always full time machine drive, this next never actually presents an issue. It just makes me a bit anxious. I already have Backblaze running. It would be fine with time machine not having several months or years of data. Is there a P-list modification launch agent or something I can use to make time machine both generate and keep around fewer backups? All right, here we go. Um, let's start off with photos. Uh, I think what you're doing now is the best solution for photos. Um, and Apple confirms this because they have a nice little article called move your photos library to save space on your Mac. Um, but here's a one line in there that uh, I think should drive your decision as to what to use. Um, to prevent data loss, Apple doesn't recommend storing photo libraries on external storage devices like SD cards and USB flash drives or drives that are shared on a network. In other words, don't put a photos library on an NAS. <laughs> no, I, and I, I can uh, attest to this. This is one of those do as I say and as I do scenarios. I would love to store my photos library on a NAS. Uh, I, I did that with my iPhotos libraries and they it mostly worked OK. There were, you know, some occasional issues with it. But for, by and large, iPhoto was totally functional on a NAS. With photos, that is not the case whatever they're doing with the structure of the library putting it on a nas is no bueno um you might be able to get away with putting it on like a uh a, you know a disk image on your nas but like i i wouldn't but maybe or an iSCSI partition on your nas maybe but you know you're 
I, I wouldn't. I would just do it on a on a external direct attach drive. Given everything that we've seen about this, I as tempted as I am to put it on my NAS, you know, in some way, I I have not and will not. So th- there you go. That's hopefully that helps support the theories. Yeah. Yeah. Now, as for time machine, um, having a direct connect uh, driver array. Uh, can certainly do it. But I'd like to suggest, in this case, a NAS, like a Drobo or a Synology, because they both support Time Machine, and they also support defining and expanding the size of uh, or the amount of space that can be used. Um, you could do it with a Direct Connect, as, as it sounds like you're doing already here in Resards Partitions and all that stuff, but that makes me kind of jumpy. So... Um, Yes. Yeah. So that, um, you know, that was kind of what he was proposing is, you know, I should probably use one thing for photos backup and one thing for time machine. So I, I, I would agree with that. Um, as for modifying time machine behavior, uh, I mean, there's, there's two things you can do. One is time machine editor, which lets you change the frequency at which time machine does its thing, which I think is normally once every hour, which in my opinion, is too much. I think I set it for once every eight hours. Um, And then just use good judgment in uh, excluding things, which is system preferences, time machine options. Uh, I personally exclude very large files like my photos library. (laughs) Uh, What else? And I think my uh, parallels VMs because they're all like multi gigabyte and Right. I just don't don't want to use a time machine for that. Right. Um, I right. will. I will back it up uh, when I'm doing a clone. I just back up everything with my clone. But yeah, that that would be my suggestion. Is uh, keep keep the huge. Yeah, uh, I would I would exclude very large files, and that's what I got. All right. So I'm gonna. Uh, what you suggested isn't necessarily. Uh, it certainly isn't wrong. It, I mean, it, it obviously will work just fine. I, I I will put an asterisk on work just fine. This is one of those do as I say, not as I do scenarios. Um, time machine over the network. We've talked about it a lot on on this show over many episodes is not really reliable. It's not built to be config, you know, to be used over the network. It will work, but occasionally and I would say expect it to happen once to twice a year. Your backup destination will get corrupted because there would have been some network disconnect uh, that caused that corruption during a backup. And you need to wipe your backup and start from scratch or painstakingly go through and try and repair your time machine backup. So if you are doing this over the network with time machine, just expect that to happen. That's what I do. I know it's it's what you do too, John. So, uh, you know, like it, it works. It's fine, but it is not optimal for Time Machine, just so you know. That said, um, if you're going to do direct attached for photos, which you have to do, and you want that to be a uh, expandable solution, and you also want a similarly expandable solution for time machine and you want those volumes to be sort of malleable or adjustable in size i would actually do both as direct attached i would do them both on the same volume and i would use apfs for this so let's start with the volume i i would go with uh with as uh james mentioned some you know jbod just a bunch of discs type of solution so uh, you know other world computing has lots of these, you know, Thunder Bay raid enclosures that will uh, that will do this. Uh, but y- you can also just go online and and find all sorts of different JBOD enclosures. Uh, obviously, if you want one that has the support and backing of a company like OWC, then that's that's where I would go and get this. But you can th- there are options, right? And Mac OS is actually pretty good at stitching these together. I would then make that into an APFS um, 
uh, formatted blob of data because the nice part about APFS is that you can have multiple volumes on that blob of data and adjust them. So it's it's not the partitioning thing that we used to think about with HFS plus it's APFS. You can change the size. You can change the quota essentially to say, yeah, limit the time machine one to X, you know, number of gigabytes so that it doesn't just, you know, use up all your data. And I, I think it might, I think that might actually give you the solution you're looking for. So JBOD and APFS with two volumes or three volumes, if you want to have a third volume for something that might do it. The only issue with that is um, you, what I just suggested involves no raid. Now you could do, you know, raid instead of just the JBOD and with RAID, you get OneDrive's worth of fault tolerance, which also means you get the the expandability uh, of of RAID, where you can add drives to this thing as as you move forward. So, so those are my those are my thoughts. That's uh, just you know different different i a bunch of different ideas. I don't know. Any more thoughts from you, John? No. Okay. I um, it's interesting though because the my time machine backups uh, actually the one on my MacBook Pro is uh, let's see oldest backup June twentieth twenty eighteen. Okay, so you're and it hasn't corrupted yet. So. Yet, right? So we'll see. <laughs> that's pretty good though. I I mean like that's longer than I would expect it to go. I mean that's a that's obviously a year. So yeah, that's pretty good. Huh. Cool. Cool. All right. Uh, are we good with uh, with that one from James? Yes. Cool. John, not you, but I mean, you're here. But listener John says, uh, so I was going through some things and realized that I use. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, yeah. A, oh, no, he, we already talked about Choosy. He had a question. We talked about Choosy last week. Uh, he says, I am constantly plagued on my Mac with autocorrect issues. While I know the simple answer is to turn it off, uh, uh, it does catch an awful lot of mistypes, which I do like. My issues seem to center around the period. Usually when I'm trying to type a URL, it decides that when I hit a period, that is when it should invoke autocorrect, or it should put a space after the period, or put a space in the concatenated first word at the front of the URL. All of these, of course, require me to go back and correct the text and hope it doesn't correct again. I know, and here's a quick tip for those of you that don't, uh, he says, I know that if I hit escape, it dismisses and undoes the autocorrect. So there's the quick tip. Uh, but a lot of the time I'm typing fast enough that I don't even see the mini autocorrect dialogue before I hit the period and I just blast through it. And you're right. You can also use undo sometimes with command Z to if, if you don't catch it with the escape. But but yes, I, I'm with you on this. Uh, he says the question. Is there a way to set rule based behavior for autocorrect so that I can retain uh, the, you know, T.E.H. to T.H.E. and lowercase I to capital I corrections? Uh, but I can say ignore a period as a marker for a correction to be initiated when it's in a URL. I don't know, man. Uh, this is a good one. Uh, so maybe this becomes a geek challenge. I don't know of any way to really tweak autocorrect other than if there's something specific that it keeps correcting and you don't want it to correct it, then you can go into system preferences, keyboard text, and in there put, this is where you can set your own text expansion or replacements, whatever you want to call it. Um, if you put, both you put the same thing in for both so let's say for example that you wanted uh like for me i like to use the word cogitating uh it's a great word right we are always cogitating on things around here uh autocorrect doesn't like it so i put cogitating in both the replace and with columns spelled exactly the same and that will keep autocorrect from messing with that word because it says oh yeah right it, when he types this he means this yeah exactly and so that's fine but there's no way to say don't do it after a period like there's no rules-based adjustments you can make just very specific text so 
I don't know what the magic would be. Paul Franz in our chat room at macgeekab.com slash stream uh, suggests perhaps a keyboard shortcut to disable autocorrect for a period of time. So a, a toggle that you could do with your keyboard. I bet there's a way to do that with keyboard maestro. Is there? I think so. Yeah, because you just I'll go in and uncheck the box in that same place system preferences keyboard text uncheck the correct spelling automatically uh there are two other boxes there at least on on uh, i haven't put mojave on this machine yet because it's the audio machine and i always keep it where it where it is for a while but um capitalize words automatically and add a period with a double space uh, could be things that maybe you don't want to uh to have enabled either so uh, so there you go. Are you running Mojave on the machine that you're looking at, John? Does your system preferences keyboard text have those three uh, checkboxes? Mojave. Uh, let's see. Where are we going here? <clears throat> system preferences. System preferences. Keyboard. Then what? Text. Yeah, let's see. Correct spelling automatically, capitalized words automatically, add period with double space. Okay, so you have the same three checkboxes. Yeah, I, uh -huh. I have found on my machines that I don't, I only check the first one and not the other two. Um, just because it gets in my way more often than not. But, but, you know, you can, so perhaps messing with those will do it. But if anybody knows uh, of a way to really, you know, manipulate the rules that it uses uh, feedback at MacGeekup.com. We'd love to hear from you. Wow. John, I said feedback at MacGeekup.com. Uh, I don't know if I quite heard that. Did you say feedback at MacGeekup.com? I did. Have you had your caffeine yet today, Mr. Braun? Yeah, I'm working on it. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Uh, you want to take us to Paul, John? Yeah, I was just looking at something here regarding, it looks like there may be a way to actually edit. Uh, that's an old article. Never edit, mind. edit what? Yeah, there's a, they have an article that talks about how to edit the system dictionary. Oh, interesting. Huh. How to remove a word you added to the dictionary on Mac OS. Uh, it's from 2016. Huh. No, I just searched for edit Mac dictionary. Yeah. And there are a few things out there. All right. Well, it's kind of roundabout though. <clears throat> oh, yeah, it sounds right. Right. Cool. Cool. Well, All we'll right. put a link to that in the, uh, in the show notes. So but yeah. at least did you there. find it? Uh, I found one. So I put that link there, but if you've got something, put another link. It's all good. Okay. All right, Paul. All right. Where are we? Paul, Paul, Paul. All right, Paul. Gentlemen, I just wanted to put my two cents in. Personally, with the next version of Mac OS, I think everyone should nuke and pay for one reason. The OS is pure 64-bit. The upgrade should clean things up, but there are just too many variables to consider. There isn't the same type of control over Mac OS as there is in iOS. I've upgraded my machine late 2013 MacBook Pro Retina. Um, every up and have updated ever since Mavericks with no issues. And I think after six years, it's time for a fresh start. I know this applies. I know this is apples and oranges, no pun intended. But if you ever upgraded your Windows Vista seven, eight, or eight point one to Windows ten, it worked, but it just didn't feel right. Things were just a bit off, and a new can pay was the fix. Okay, um, and he brings up a good point, uh, especially in light of the fact uh, that the warnings that we've been getting for a while now on 32-bit uh, apps will come up and say, hey, this is not optimized for your Mac. Right. Uh, so that's what that's saying then. Um, now, Apple does have a little ditty, though, to prepare you for this. Okay. They had it out for a while, and, and it's called 32-bit app compatibility with Mac OS High Sierra 10.13.4 and later. Okay. And they have a suggestion in there that's something that I did recently. So... Uh, you may want to try this first, but um, using various system tools, you can identify your lingering 32-bit apps and update them before you do the upgrade. Um, when I did a scan, I was actually surprised to find that uh, it was my ScanSnap software was 32-bit. And I'm like, what? Huh? 
hadn't updated it for a while. And I went to their site and they had a whole uh, a whole different suite or a whole different upgrade. That well, that's is, good. Uh, 64 bits. Okay. So, um, you know, most of it is in where system report, uh, software applications. I think if you click on that, it'll show you the bittiness of, of things. Yep. So you can look through that. You could also look um, an activity monitor. That's another place. And I think they suggest that as well. You can see all the running processes. Um, and I think Apple's, it, it was funny though, because when I did this in the past, Apple still had one or two 32 bit daemons or background processes. <laughs> Yeah, that it's right. Yeah, Apple was was for for a little while. I mean, the Finder was one of the last Apple apps to to make the jump to sixty four bit. Right? I mean, it's there now, and it's been there for a little while. But it was kind of funny to see. Well, wait a minute. You know, what do you mean sixty four bit? So, but uh, but yeah, it's all there now. Yeah. Clean clean so, my um, Mac is another way to not o- right. to not only find what sixty four bit, but clean my Mac will also suggest updates. Um, you know, they have a really big database of, of apps. And so they, they can tell you, Hey, no, no, no. Like this app's floating out here. You might want to update it, but yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, I'm curious as to any more thoughts you have on, on Paul. Yeah. I mean, um, if you're unable to purge or update to all 64 bits, then yeah, I agree that a new campaign would probably be a good thing. Of course, personally, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, try to purge my system of all things and uh, and see how, how their migration assistant does or their updater, how, yeah. how it does. Yep. See what it catches. Yeah. And remember, it's not only updating the apps and such, it's adding another volume and putting all your system files out there. But as we discussed last week, that's and, and really, as we just discussed talking about James, you know, a, a few minutes ago. Adding another volume to an APFS drive is nothing uh, because it doesn't partition. So that that really isn't that big of a deal in terms of a, the process of it. It might have some functional impact on a few apps, but uh, but really it shouldn't on most things. If they've been following the rules, then then it shouldn't be a problem. So, yeah. All right. Anything else on uh, on this with Paul? Nope, can't wait. Okay. Or actually, wait, I should get the beta. No, I shouldn't. Yeah, you should. I've been <laughs> I've been running no, I've been running the beta on a on an external drive on my uh on one of my machines. It you absolutely it's worth running. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, gonna, yeah. yeah I gotta put something together. I, I will say that the the beta has been running super smooth for me. Like it they're the only reason. I'm not running it as my main OS other than perhaps the obvious, you know, it's still beta one man uh, is mail plugins, which is constantly a, an issue with OS updates. I use uh, small cubes mail suite, but um, it, it, it mail will not launch or will not load a plugin that doesn't explicitly advertise that it is, compatible with the current version of mail which changes with a major os update so even if there's no fundamental changes in the way mail uses plugins and it doesn't seem like there is but i say that as very much in my you know layman role not in any sort of programmer role so it's possible that there are some changes out there but um it will not launch that and so they would have to update you know, or at least release some kind of a beta to do that. And uh, they are notoriously slow over there at small cubed uh, releasing updates. In fact, it wasn't until long after Mojave was out that we had mail suite for, for Mojave. So I'm hoping that they've uh, switched things up and it's, uh, it's better now with Catalina and we'll see it, you know, before the release date. Which is which is really all we can expect. We, we we should not be expecting developers to be ready with with betas, though some people like iMazing uh, already are right there. Like some folks are, are doing it. And it depends on not only their uh, their aggressiveness with with updates, but also how difficult it is with the new OS, because these people just found out about it, you know, two weeks ago, just like the rest of us. So um but as long as they have it ready for release of Catalina or maybe a week or two before that, then that 
that's that's a reasonable expectation if they're later than that then then we'll ding them but otherwise you know there you go so let's hope that mail suite um is ready for catalina but yeah other other than not being able to use mail suite in it i find catalina when i'm running it to be very very stable and uh very reliable i haven't had any weird problems uh I'm also running iPad OS 13 on my 10 and a half inch iPad. And uh, that is equally as stable. And the, the browsing of it, like Safari is so much better that that whole thing about uh, desktop class browsing that, that, you know, Apple was talking about at WWDC definitely holds true. It's a much better browsing experience on, uh, on iPad OS. I have had some wonkiness with like the which keyboard appears at which times. And sometimes something in the lower right corner looks like it's obscuring the keyboard, even though you can't see what's obscuring it. Uh, but, you know, it's beta software. So these sorts of things are expected. Uh, but other than that, uh, iPad OS 13 works great. I do have one little rant, though, John, uh, with iPad OS, you know. Um, do you want to know what it is? <clears throat> go okay i like that you know i pass music files around with friends things we've recorded things that things that we have the rights to pass around with each other and i use uh you know icloud music library i used apple music but also i just play songs on my phone and my ipad if someone emails me a song or I download a song, which I'll note on iPad OS, there's a download manager, right? You can save things to files, including songs. So I download a song in iPad OS, an MP3. I save it to my files app. Ain't no way to add it to the music app. Why is that? What is up with this, Apple? Why in the world can I not add songs to the music app? You talk about making the iPad, you know, not dependent on a Mac. Something as simple as adding a song to my music library. And I have to go and use my Mac to do that and then wait until it syncs via the cloud or however else I want it to sync to my my iPad it's freaking crazy. It doesn't make any sense to me. Why in the world I can't just add a song to my music library right there. There's no technical reason for this. There never has been one, I will point out. And there certainly isn't one now, especially with the ability to literally download a file, save it to the files app. I can do all kinds of things. I could share it to you via Slack. I could do all kinds of other things. I just can't put it in my music library. It's freaking crazy. Freaking crazy. I'm sure I have no idea why I, it feels like an oversight at this point, to be perfectly honest. I, I submitted a, uh, they, I mean, bug replay, bug reports and feature requests are both now in the feedback assistant. And so I, I did submit this. So I'm not just ranting. I, I have submitted this that presumably more as a feature request than a bug report, but it feels like a bug at this point that you can do all these things with the music file, except the freaking most obvious thing, which is putting it right there, right there. My music library. I could put it in a third party music library. Uh, you know, if I had some third party app or whatever, I'm sure I could do that. Yep. Sweet. It'd be great if I should tech check it with Spotify. Wouldn't it be ironic if I could add MP3s to my Spotify library on my phone, but not to my uh, not to my music library. I don't know if that's possible, but that would it certainly seems possible. If I can add them to any other third party app with the sharing sheet, then I can probably add it to Spotify if they make Spotify, you know, capable of receiving such things. Drives me crazy, John. Any thoughts on that, Mr. Braun? Hello? <laughs> no, I've never had that particular frustration. Okay. All right. <coughs> Uh, all right. I'm going to give you an opportunity to get uh, a little more coffee or whatever it is. You've got about three minutes, John, while I talk about our next two sponsors, if that's okay by you. Okay. All right. I am so stoked to have Linode on board as a sponsor for this episode. 
We're at Linode, L-I-N-O-D-E dot com slash M-G-G. You can use promo code M-G-G 2019 to get a $20 credit for this awesome service where they host whatever you want. Everything they have is native SSD Linux based servers and you can get dedicated servers if you need that or for just as little as five bucks a month, you can get a nanode there from them. That is a great way to get started and maybe is all you need. And if you remember, I said a $20 credit, $5 nanode, that's more than a three month trial. In fact, that's a four month trial. If you do the math, the way that I do it here. And what's cool is sure. If you like the command line and you know what you want to do, go set up a server. They will give you a root login and you're good to go. But if you're not into that or you don't have time for that, they have all kinds of pre configured servers that you can launch, right? That are your own. I launched a VPN server. It took all of about four clicks and 90 seconds and I was up and running. If you need a WordPress installation for your business, boom, you're up and running. They've got 10 different data centers worldwide that you can pick from, including their latest in Toronto, which allows them to comply with all the in-country data protection requirements and all that. It is cool and you've got to check it out. I'm using it. You can use it just like me. Host your own VPN in the cloud. They're totally cool with it and more. Go to linode.com slash MGG. Promo code MGG2019 gets you a $20 credit. Our thanks to Linode for sponsoring this episode. Next up, I'd like to thank Otherworld Computing for being a sponsor of this episode. You know how much John and I love Otherworld Computing. Man, this is the first place I go. Really, seriously, if I need anything for my Mac, MacSales.com. That's what I type into my browser. You can do the same thing. There's nothing different about us. You just go to your browser. You type in MacSales.com. You're doing the same thing that we're doing. You're getting the same hardware and the reason I like to go with these guys is they know what they're doing. They understand the products that they're selling. They're Apple users just like us. But they grok this stuff like to its core. They truly understand it all. And their new Aura Pro X2 internal NVMe flash SSD. This thing's freaking amazing. Capacity up to two terabytes and crazy speeds, read speeds over 3,200 megabytes a second, megabytes, that was not, I did not misspeak, write speeds, 2,400 megabytes per second, totally crazy performance at awesome prices. You got to check this out and more. Whatever you need for your Mac, this is the first place I go. Again, visit MacSales.com and our thanks to MacSales and Otherworld Computing for sponsoring this episode. And now to James. What do we got here? All right. James is on the hook okay. for helping his future in-laws move from rented Comcast home network hardware to owned by them home network hardware. And uh, he's been given pretty wide latitude to decide what that hardware should be. Uh, nothing fancy, just a new modem and a new mesh Wi-Fi system. Their needs are modest. They have a single level home, about 1,900 square feet and squarish. But my count, they by my count, they have nearly 10 devices, which could be considered requiring a large amount of bandwidth, phones, computers, tablets, streaming, et cetera, gaming, um, and about as many low bandwidth smart home devices like doorbells and cameras and stuff. Actually, a camera may not be that very low bandwidth. That is true. I think about it because yeah. you're streaming, you're streaming video. My so, cam, um, my Foscam cameras in the house uh, are f far and away the biggest bandwidth hogs that I have. Mm -hmm. Far and away. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So um, there's one to three people at home at any given time, and they currently have 150 megabits down, but can upgrade to 250 if necessary. Current plan is to get an Aero Pro and two Aero Beacons and a surfboard DOCSIS 3.0 cable modem. I use Velips, but the app doesn't keep me signed in reliably and is not particularly full featured. On occasion, I've been unable to access the network because of Linksys's server being down. I've used a number of surfboard modems for more than a decade and never had any issue with them. I want to pick the mesh system that is least likely to give them any random frustrations because I don't want to become their Comcast. I've heard consistently good things about the Eero, uh, so I'm hoping this is a good move. Questions. Is the hardware I've picked likely sufficient? 
or do you have recommendation for another mesh system? Uh, should I go for Eero Pros for a home of that size? They won't be connecting the extra nodes to Ethernet, so I assume the benefit would be negligible. Number two, I know some of the mesh network systems have set up with a wizard that tries to help you decide on node placement. Are there any other utilities I should be equipped with on iOS or Mac? I plan on picking up a USB-C to Ethernet adapter so I can hook directly into the modem. And finally, any notes on the cable modem? Spending extra money on Doxis 3.1 doesn't make sense to me at this point, given their current plan. All right. Um, I'll give you my viewpoint, and you may have something to add, Dave. Sure. I hope you do. Um, I'm sure. But I got a similar, I got a, I would say a similar setup, a uh, little smaller, but 1,200 square feet, two stories. And I think about the same number of devices um, that he has. So I think he's got it covered. Um, I like how he, he broke out the, uh, you know, the devices there and then, you know, try to do the math here. So uh, some of the math that I did, some of the quick math, um, like, for example, Netflix, most Netflix clients, like uh, if you're running it on the TiVo and you hit the info button, it'll show you the streaming rate. And at least for HD, um, it takes about four megabits a second. Um, if you're talking 4K video, um, well, guess what? Multiply that by four. So you'd need 16 megabits uh, for each uh, 4K stream. And I guess, you know, keep doing the math with, you know, the higher resolutions. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. And I did a quick search. Uh, you know, how much bandwidth should you have just, for gaming? Just so you know, Netflix says that you need 25 megabits per second for 4K. Just really yeah because okay. it's just it's not just 4k it's 4k ultra hd which is uhd that's fine with hdr so there i think there's more data than you might be calculating but just just so you know yeah okay but still yeah, plenty, so I, they have plenty of mm -hmm. internet bandwidth for this just just so you know yeah yeah and the same thing with with gaming um the information that i could get is that you know uh, four megabits uh, should be sufficient so it doesn't sound like you're going to saturate it um, as for the modem, uh, you know, Comcast apparently is rolling out Doxis 3.1. Um, that's what they call their gigabit I connections. Just so folks know that 3.1 is, is what they're using to do gigabit. Yeah. But I, I would concur that unless you have a very high bandwidth plan, like Dave's just mentioned, uh, I don't think you're going to see a benefit with a 3.1 modem. Um, what 3.1 does, one thing that 3.1 does from what I recall, and I think you, you found, or you told us about Dave is that it does solve the dreaded upstream buffer bloat issue. Yep. Uh, the even protocol if, does. Even on a normal 3.0 connection. So even on your 150 megabit connection, having a 3.1 modem would solve that. You're absolutely right. Yep. Yeah. Um, the nice thing is that the mesh vendors uh, will also do that as well. And Eero is one of them. Yeah, not all of them, but but Eero, yes, some of them, and Eero's one of them. Yep. Yeah, so I'd say you should be okay with a Doxis 3.0 surfboard. Um, as for the mesh system, the first generation Eero with three nodes works fine for me, so I think it worked fine for you. Um, the setup, I think, does the best. The setup for, for a lot of these things isn't a site survey. It, it I think it's just seeing if all of the components uh, are meshing. <laughs> Can it see them? Or at least that, that was my recollection when I set it up. It's like, okay, yeah, that's uh, the, the one you just added is close enough. Um, right. But what you could do is what I just mentioned, something called a site survey, and they have a tool to do this. Uh, my favorite, I haven't run on in a while, um, is called NetSpot. Um, basically, what it shows is, you know, the signal strength or, or speeds um, in various locations on a map, which you actually draw a little map of your house and you indicate where you are and you say, OK, measure, measure the stuff here. And uh, once you're done, you get a visual map that shows you how things look. Um, or you could just do speed tests in various. Uh, I, I've. I did the uh, low tech. The, the low tech version is to just do a speed test in, in various locations. For example, I found that I have an issue in my uh, upstairs band room and the bandwidth was much lower. 
uh, probably all the tile and stuff like that. Um, I found in that case that an extender, which uh, adding an extender actually increased my my uh, throughput because uh, it was uh, connecting at the uh, to the Eero at at the higher five uh, higher speed five gigahertz. Whereas before it was connecting at 2.4. But I could also, and actually, you know, I think I'm going to do this. I may actually replace that thing with an Eero node. I think that would probably uh, offer the same benefit. Oh, yeah. We got to get you another Eero node to do that. So just so you have this single point of management. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We should see what we can do to uh, to make that happen. That'd be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, because putting another putting a, a Gen One base in there, um, there's really not a a good place to put it <laughs> in that room. Whereas I think the uh, whereas I think the uh, the node would be a, a little little. Oh, more you're talking about an Eero beacon? Is that right? Or the beacon? Yes. Got it. Okay, so we need to get you an Eero beacon. Okay, cool. All right, let me let me see if we can make that happen for you. That'd be good. Yeah, you know, you you know my bathroom there. It's like you know, there's an outlet with two plugs, and and there's nowhere to place the uh, Gen One unit or the base. <laughs> right, 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 or the Gen Two unit. I mean, which are, is basically the same form factor. It's a little bit bigger, I think, but basically the same thing. But still, yes, separate power supply and device. Whereas the beacon just literally lives on the wall. You, it, it, the plugging it into the wall is all you do. It that that's 100 percent of of it. Yeah. Yeah, and then as far as administ administration, um, I think you do this for your uh, your dad, right? Is that you? Uh, you can remotely get yes. in and check things out if there's trouble. Yes. So, uh, yes. Yeah. So that's what I got to say about that. Okay, so I have some thoughts on on all of this. Um, I I would when there you you're right that your house and it, it's similar to theirs the number of devices you have is similar to theirs one thing for all of us to think about when we're sort of specking out a system for someone else is those two factors for sure how many devices how big is the house what's the layout of the house is almost more important than size or equally as important as size but one other factor to to remember is how many people because chances are, if you're just one person, it doesn't matter how many devices you have, you're probably not streaming to multiple devices simultaneously, right? So you're, you're not watching three Netflix flick shows at the same time at your house. You would generally only be watching one. And, and so that is a thing to think about. And Mesh really does make a difference here, uh, even if you didn't necessarily need the coverage of Mesh. Having multiple access points running simultaneously can allow devices to get, you know, sort of uh, I'm using air quotes here, dedicated bandwidth uh, for individual devices. So you're not sharing that Wi-Fi stream, uh, which can make a big, a huge difference uh, for people. So just remember, you know, I, and I, I think what you're talking about with the system there is it makes perfect sense. Like, it, I, frankly, I think you are your home is a little over engineered for you. You you don't you have more than more capacity than you need in, in several ways. And that's in this case, not a bad thing at all. Um, mm -hmm. With ethernet, there was some discussion in the question and the answer about uh, not needing the second gen Eros uh, because none of them would be connected to ethernet and therefore wouldn't benefit from that. So, I, I might actually twist that around and say, because none of them will be connected to Ethernet, you might very much benefit from having Eero Pros as opposed to single, you know, first gen Eros or Eero Beacons. And the reason is the Eero Pros, the second gen Eero, has three radios in it, whereas the Beacon and the first gen Eero have two radios that's the biggest difference between those devices other than form factor with the beacon as we discussed where that's a benefit if you don't have ethernet is now if you're using those euro pros they can essentially dedicate one of those three radios to the backhaul between the euro units and then each of them has two radios completely unencumbered by backhaul to use for what I call a front hall, 
uh, backhaul being the communication amongst the mesh itself. So amongst all the Eero devices, front haul is communication to all of your client devices. So having that extra radio really actually can help, especially when you don't have Ethernet. So uh, so there you go. Uh, so just bear that in mind. That said, I think the 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 Eero with two beacons set up, especially if it's an Eero Pro. So your main router is the Eero Pro with the three radios and then two beacons from there, each with two radios. That's probably going to be enough for what you're describing uh, here, James. But just, you know, just uh, for all of us, because we try to sort of zoom out a little bit here and, and, and just make sure we see uh, we see the big picture. All that said, and I 100 percent agree with the the choice to go with Eero on this. Uh, it is, you know, the Eero and plume super pods are what I would call the Cadillac of, of consumer grade mesh systems, but it's always really hard not to have this conversation without mentioning TP links deco. Uh, it really is um, a, a great mesh system and it's very, very uh, aggressively priced. The one thing that they don't have is the uh, is any sort of buffer bloat protection. So, uh, you know, for that reason alone, I, I, I still lean towards Eero. That said, when I've got a relative who says, hey, I want some mesh system, but I don't want to spend a ton of money. TP-Link Deco is 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 what they have. So I have uh, I've got. I think three relatives running TP link decos and I had another three relatives slash friends running, uh, running Eros too. And everybody's happy is the reality. The people that are going to be backing up a lot of things, uploading to iCloud photo library, like those sorts of constant upstream things, either put a Doxis 3.1 modem in or use some mesh system that has buffer bloat protection like Eero, uh, but the TP-Link Deco stuff is just really, I mean, it's really impressive. And it wouldn't, I don't know about the CPUs that they have in those things. So I don't know if they could do buffer bloat protection in, you know, the older slash current hardware, but it's, it's worth, it's worth, you know, considering. So anyway, I throw that out there, but in this scenario, especially if, if, you know, they are of the financial means to spend uh, you know, maybe an extra 100, maybe 150 bucks on, on a system like this just to eliminate headache. But go with Euro 100 percent. Don't you know, don't think about it. But but just to bear in mind that TP-Link Deco really they they're you know, they're nipping at the heels uh, of these in a way that uh, competes very, very aggressively with uh, price wise. So there you go. Those are my thoughts. Anything more, John? <clears throat> We're good. Cool. E. Oh, all right. Let's stay on Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi is fun. Uh, Corey has a question and uh, and Corey asks, he says, I have Synology's router and mesh points around the house. I need to figure out how to add one outside next to the garage. So my car is parked in the driveway can access Wi-Fi. I do have a mesh point in the garage, but the signal in the driveway outside the garage is pretty weak, so it doesn't really work. So how can I weatherproof an access point and put it outside? So um, if I were starting from scratch, I would probably go with Ubiquiti's Unify for this. Uh, they, for the simple reason, so Ubiquiti's Unify is most definitely an enterprise grade mesh system with a huge asterisk that it says it's priced not terribly for the prosumer in the home. So geeks like us unify is a, a, a workable option. And I'll, I'll put a link to the Mac geek Ab episode where we discussed unify initially it, it only so you can hear the explanation of how it works. It's basically an a la currently an a la carte mesh system where you buy the router separate from the wireless access point, separate from the switch. And then you sort of piecemeal it together to get exactly what you need. And what's cool about Unify is they have tons of different types, form factors, features of access points. And of course, one of them is, you know, usable outside. And so you can really kind of make, uh, you know, assemble the system that you want for you. 
they are coming out uh, with what they call the, their dream machine, I think, which is an all in one. Um, it's in beta right now, but I'll put a link to it anyway. It's an all in one um, router, wireless access point and switch. So very similar to every other router that you would buy in a consumer scenario. And it's uh, quite a bit cheaper than buying these things separately. So it's a, it's a night. It will be once it's out, it will be a nice entry point into, uh, into this. That said, you already have a system. So again, I would kind of lean towards, you know, sort of breaking the mesh similar to what you've done at your house, John, and using a TP link, uh, access point to do the outdoor stuff and they do have um an ac 1200 wireless uh you know indoor outdoor access point from uh and, and it's available for less than 100 bucks i think it's like 77 dollars or something so we'll put a link to that in the show notes and it's a you know ac 1200 so it's going to do what you need and um and there you go so that's that's what i would go with that one do you have any thoughts on that john no, sounds good, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it's you know, it gets it gets interesting. There's no perfect way to get there, um, but you know, this, this I think this would would probably get you pretty close. So anyway, good. More on that, John. Less on that. No. Okay, uh, Richard. While we're on the Wi-Fi thing, let's let's do a three for here. Richard asks, he says, I'm going on holiday soon to a remote site in Scotland that I know has a Wi-Fi connection approximately a thousand feet away. Line of sight across a lake. Don't worry. It's a public connection. So if I can get connected, I won't get caught. Do you know of or have any experience of long range Wi-Fi external antennas that could pull in a weak signal from that distance? I'm looking to connect to something uh, that will connect to my MacBook Pro. Uh, he says a quick Amazon search pulls up some options such as the Signal King USB Wi-Fi adapter that seemed to get good reviews, but seems very inexpensive, approximately US $40 if you do the translation. He says, I was expecting to have to invest in something more advanced, possibly something from Ubiquity or TP-Link, but I can't figure out which devices can operate as a simple directional antenna rather than anything more advanced. Uh, it's going to be a one-way arrangement, so it's not the same as setting up a point-to-point -point network in a large property where I could have devices at either end. He says, I don't get to control what's on the other end. I just get to control what's on my end. So, I, you know, it, the, the first thing is to, to note is that this is a pretty simple problem to solve from a physics standpoint. You just need, you know, Wi-Fi, the range that we are accustomed to with Wi-Fi is because our antennas are essentially non-directional they are uh, you know omnidirectional and because of that uh, you know they don't go all that far they go far enough for our homes of course usually or we need mesh but wi-fi can go really far like it, you know tens of miles if you focus it the right way so a dish aimed in the right direction that can capture a signal is really what you need and that might be why you're finding this stuff relatively inexpensive um, it's obviously better if that signal on the other side of the lake is also directional and aimed at you, right? So you're not just trying to grab something that's coming from a much weaker signal, but uh, even without that, it's, it's usually doable. Um, so it's possible that signal King will do it or, you know, something like it reviews on the one that I found for that signal King. Uh, it's questionable at best. So with that in mind, um, ubiquity has two things that seem like they might do it for you. The light beam or power beam. And, uh, and I'll put links to both of those. Um, but it's not, that's not going to be inexpensive equipment. So uh, that might not go the, the right route. That said, uh, you know, kind of searching around and hunting a little bit. I did find, um, on Amazon, of course, of all places. Uh, but a simple Wi-Fi ultra long range Wi-Fi extender directional parabolic grid outdoor antenna for a hundred bucks. So this is just a Wi-Fi antenna. 
uh, you would plug it in to your, uh, you know, to your router or whatever that would need to have a, a removable antenna connection, which you might have like those definitely exist. You know, we see them all the time. And uh, and you just plug in and and use that as your antenna and in theory, good to go. So, you know, that's that's those are those are my thoughts on this. But it is a relatively easy problem to solve. I I have seen people solve this with homemade like, you know, garbage can dishes and things like that, like for twelve dollars and, you know, some solder or whatever. So it's it it really just is an antenna problem. John, you've you've done crazy things like this. What you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I did. I think I still have it. Yeah, I was playing around with that at one point too. Lucent made a range extending antenna. Okay. Uh, I think I still have it. Um, what I was looking up though, uh, there's another suggestion. I don't know if you recall this, but um, they call it a cantenna. Because you make it out of a Pringles can. Yeah, exactly. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to. Yeah, and it looks like it's pretty inexpensive to make, but uh, right. not getting good information on how far people are able to go with that. Yeah. 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 All very doable. Uh, that's crazy. I'm looking. I'm looking at somebody. Yeah, somebody just used a tripod and a BNC connector. And some tape. I mean, this really is like a MacGyver solution here. And, uh, and that with the tripod, you can, you know, fix the location and aim it and you're good to go. Cantenna. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see here. Actually, I see there's a YouTube video where somebody said they got 600 feet. Hmm. All right. So, you know, oh. but 600 feet, you know, across a lake, you have zero interference like right, nothing right. so you might get more than 600 feet you know yeah so that's pretty good i like this this is good i i want to hear back please keep us posted richard um with what you choose to do and and what you um how you know what your success looks like because this is interesting fun stuff like i said my i, I think i talked about it a couple of years ago my uncle built some you know cheap little dish antennas that he just plugged into some $20, you know, TP link or D link. I think it was some D link routers, like old D link routers. And he was like, yeah, it works fine. He just has to occasionally go and, and cut holes in the, in the trees, you know, cut the right branches so that he has a line of sight and then it works great. And he's, he's got his connection between his two houses across the street from each other. So he can save the whatever 40 bucks a month on, on his Wi-Fi at one of them. So smart. That's smart. All right. Uh, where are we here? Oh, we have all kinds of other questions. You know, we actually had an important one <clears throat> from Stephen. He uh, messaged us on Twitter. He says, I was listening to last week's episode. You mentioned you got a new Synology. You also mentioned that you got some of those new Iron Wolf SSDs, but you didn't specify whether you bought the products or were sent the review units free of charge. Sometimes you specify, but sometimes I'm pretty sure they're review units, but you didn't exactly say. He says, I trust your opinions on these products and knowing if they're free review units or if you paid for them is helpful in framing my thinking. And, and you're totally right. It's a great question. And we do try to specify this stuff, but we also try not to, you know, make a huge deal out of it because that distracts from what we're actually trying to do here, which is tell you about things that we really think are worthwhile. Um, reg I, so let me say this, regardless of how we procured an item, um, we will never mention it on the show if it isn't something that we'd, we would buy to use ourselves. Or if we do mention it on the show and it's not something we would buy to use ourselves, we say that. Um, now, there are also things like that we mentioned in Cool Stuff Found that come from you or that we've seen elsewhere that we haven't used. And of course, we haven't we didn't pay for them, nor have we gotten them for free. They are just, you know, things in existence out there. Um our offices are filled with stuff that we test and ignore. For example, uh, you know, I have the Asus Lyra mesh system uh, that they sent me for review. I, I did not pay for it, nor would I, uh, given the way it currently works. It's 
janky and clunky and uh, not at all something I would even recommend it. Frankly, even if you could get it for free, it's it, it doesn't work all that well, um, but I've never mentioned it. Right. And for good reason. So now so hopefully that explains what we do here. We, you know, it really is. Would we buy it? Would we use it? Um, and, and if so, then, then yeah, then there it is, but we'll try to be more, uh, you know, more diligent about that without, uh, completely changing the focus of the show. So to answer your question specifically, yeah, both, both the DS 1019 plus and the iron wolf SSDs are review units. And for what I'm using them for, I would very happily purchase them. That 1019 plus is the best disk station for home slash prosumer use right now. It's the perfect blend of capabilities and budget consciousness, right? So they they put exactly the right CPU in there that they needed uh, without over engineering it too much, you know, so that you're not paying for something you're not using. And they did that by baking in the the hardware transcoding for the videos. So you don't need extra CPU to do it in software. Uh, it really is a, a fantastic unit. And and I'm stoked that it exists when they called me, you know, before it was out, they said, can we send you one of these and test it? I was like, whoa, wait a minute. What is this thing? Yeah, definitely. This is what we've been looking for for like the last two years. So. So, yes, absolutely. But we'll be uh, it's a great question. And thank you for for asking, Stephen. It's it's always good. So feel free to ask, you know, that's you know that we answer every email that we get, or at least we try to. And uh, and we also try to put links to everything that we have in the show notes. And then you can sign up to get the show notes delivered to your email box. Uh, just go to MacGeekGab.com, put your email address into the little subscribe box right there in the middle of the page. And boom, you will get the show notes for every episode uh, from then forward delivered to your email box so that you don't have to remember to go back to MacGeekGab to click on the links and all that stuff. And I will say this and thank you to everyone who has been doing this. But, you know, we always say that, especially with our sponsors, it is our job to get uh get you to uh, to encourage you to visit them right whether you buy or not is between you and them uh that's just how that works right we're, we're not involved in that process but we're here to you know whet your appetite for lack of a, a more succinct phrase or maybe that that is a succinct phrase so uh and and the way that you can show that we whet your appetite is by visiting our sponsors well good news all those links are right there in the in the email you get from the show notes so help that truly does help us out if you go and visit them and 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 show that you know we got you to express some interest that that actually really helps quite a bit so uh so you've got those links right there too you don't have to remember to do it it's great all right john any thoughts on any of this stuff the review stuff the uh newsletter all that good stuff anything i actually laid down some some of my own coin for uh for an iron wolf drive when i had uh another drive Yep, in one of my arrays, die. Yeah, I mean they're uh, competitively priced, and they uh, they offer extra goods. I agreed. Yeah, yeah. I would. I I'm trying to think. I think I I did the same thing because they had sent me a couple of Iron Wolf drives um, for review for free, and then when I needed to expand beyond that, yeah, I I bought some ten terabytes a year or two ago. Well, yeah, without even flinching. I mean, it's like I said, we you know. We recommend them here because that's what we would use uh, or that's what we do use. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. When we were there, that they actually at, at were. Pepcom, uh, you mean? Yeah. At Pepcom. Yeah. I saw, um, I think their largest now is uh, 18 terabyte. 16. Or 16. Yeah. No, I think it was 18. Do they? Pretty sure they had an 18 there. Really? Man, that's crazy. Yeah. But, you know, um, maybe it was a. a a mock-up or something but you know the guy was like do, do, you, do you want one and i'm like honestly you've been so good to us that um and i'm like you know what honestly i have enough storage i don't need more yeah 16 is the largest that the iron wolf and iron wolf pros come in but but it was just what they had there was the 16 yeah but still i mean it's crazy yeah <laughs> yeah and i think wd guys had uh 14 they were showing a 14 so uh they just keep getting bigger yeah and and the wd guys had a sand disc i posted a picture of this on on instagram which i will um 
by, I will link here. Uh, I think I also posted it on Twitter, but uh, a one terabyte micro SD card, like this thing was smaller than my thumbnail and holds a terabyte. I don't know how much it is. They didn't know how much it, it was going to sell for either. They kind of had it in this like, you know, Lucite cube or whatever as a display. But um, man, like crazy, crazy. So anyway, you know, fun. Do we have anything else to, uh, to talk about? You know, I, 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 we are almost at the end here, but I wanted to mention one thing and answer Rob's question, especially as people are traveling. So let's see if we can do this quickly here. And uh, hopefully it, it works. Hopefully, well, okay, there we are. Great. Rob uh, asked, he said, I just listened to 765, Mac Geekup 765, and caught your explanation of how you leverage the dual SIM functionality of your iPhone XR on AT&T and added data only service from GigSky. He says, like you, I have a XR and I happen to have it on AT&T through my employer. Uh, I was issued the phone before dual SIM functionality was enabled. Uh, in a su subsequent update. So that means my service with AT&T resides on a physical SIM in the device. It's exactly what I've got. Leaving my eSIM free, he says. At first, I was going to pursue getting my AT&T account provisioned and switched. So it was on the eSIM, leaving me to swap uh, a physical SIM in as needed. He says, however, after listening to your explanation and experience, it occurred to me I might actually be in a better position if I leave the eSIM slot free so that I can switch between data providers at will without the delay of getting or waiting for a physical SIM. I can only assume this is the method that you employed for WWDC, Dave, but I don't believe you actually clarified that point. Could you please? I assume you use the GigSky app to activate the eSIM in your 10R and will quote unquote replace that with another provider at a later date as necessary. Yeah, that is absolutely what I did. And I'm really glad you asked this question. Because that's how that works. I left my AT&T stuff on the SIM and was able to, uh, you know, at will just launch the app, which is why I said in the prior episode where we talked about this, go get all those apps, the GigSky app, the TruePhone app. Um, and there's a couple others that I can't remember off the top of my head so that they're on your phone so you can go and provision your eSIM without even needing to go to the app store to download these apps. You just can keep them there. And you're good to go. So, yes, that is exactly what I did. And that's a great question. So thanks for asking, Rob. Good stuff. Thoughts on that, John? Mm, no. Okay. Uh, Craig had one little tip. He said um, regarding the gig sky and eSIMs, he said recently, uh, or he says here in Australia, our carriers don't support eSIM. So I have a physical SIM for my primary account and the eSIM is empty. So similar to the rest of us it says I was going to Hong Kong for a getaway with some friends and was looking at getting a SIM for my time there. As I usually do for travel after hearing you talk of using eSIM, I thought I would try it out. I downloaded the gig sky and my true phone apps and looked through the plans they offered as I was doing, as I was also doing a day trip to China, I wanted to plan that would uh, work whilst I was there. The plan with gig sky did that. So it was the one I went with. It was easy to set up beforehand. And once I landed, I flipped on the data plan and was online before I got off the plane. It worked easily throughout Hong Kong and uh, my China trip. And I will use it again. There were, however, two small issues I wanted to share. The first was minor. My data plan ran out on the last day with no warning. I hit my two gig limit and it just stopped. It took me a while to figure out why my Instagram wasn't uploading. As I was out and about, I had to get hot spotted to add data and keep going. No big deal, but it would have been nice to get some kind of alert so I didn't get caught. The other issue was speed. I had assumed that because of the population density of Hong Kong, that coverage and therefore speed would be good. However, it was slow in comparison to what I usually get here at home. Pings were like 500 milliseconds or above and download speeds of 25 megabits. He said functional, but noticeable. On the whole, it worked, and I will definitely be doing the same on an upcoming trip to Singapore. So, yeah, it, I I have to chuckle a little because your 500 millisecond pings are pretty high. 25 megabits per second for downloads is faster than I get with AT and T, and I think faster than you get with Verizon, John. So, here in the states, we would we would be quite happy to get that um, at least in rural areas. I think in cities, we might be able to do a little better, but um, AT and T and Verizon aren't all that great. In our our little rural areas for speed coverage, fine speed, eh, eh, acceptable, 
But, you know, I get like with AT&T, I get like three to six, maybe in gen generally speaking. And I think you were saying that's what you get with Verizon, right, John? Uh, typically under 10. Yeah. OK, right, right, right. Um, another service, though, I uh, no, no, we're going to wait. We're, we're not talking about ah, that yet. Yes. Yep. No, we've got to right. we always got to leave them, leave them wanting a little bit more. So we will do that. And right. uh, I, yes. I know I knew you were going to defer that. <laughs> uh, just wanted to keep it on your on your radar. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. We've got all kinds of good stuff to tell you, but we are done with time for today. So that's where we go. It is time. Uh, time to say thank you for listening, for sending in all your questions, for uh, really for everything. I want to thank everybody in the chat room for helping us with the links in the show notes and helping keep us on track and uh, and reminding us if we or alerting us if we perhaps skipped something or missed something. It's awesome. And if you ever want to join the chat room, of course, MacGeekGab.com slash stream is where you can go for that. Uh, I will say thank you for all the iTunes reviews, and I I changed, well, I added a link. So MacGeekGab slash iTunes used to get you to the place where we can get you for iTunes reviews. Well, iTunes is sort of going away, so I changed that. And now you can go to MacGeekGab.com slash reviews, and uh, that will direct you to where you can help leave us reviews and, and, and help us. So, So there you go. Uh, let's see. We mentioned uh, email if you're a premium subscriber. Premium at MacGeekGab.com. I think that's enough. We've asked enough of you. We try to uh, we try to deliver more than we request, but, but you know it's, it's all good. It's a it's a uh, an exchange of energy and and information and all of that stuff, and it's been working pretty well for 14 years. So thank you. Thanks to Cashfly at Cashfly.com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Thanks to all of our great sponsors. Of course, Linode at Linode.com slash MGG, coupon code MGG2019 for 20 bucks off. Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com. Experian Boost at Experian.com slash MGG. It's free. Go do it. And LinkedIn Jobs, you get 50 bucks off at LinkedIn.com slash MGG. Or thanks to everybody. My thanks to you, John, for hosting oh. me this week. It was good to see you. Was, oh, yeah. Yeah, man. Fun stuff. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Yeah, man. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Hey, uh, hey, John. Mm hmm got any advice for anybody lasting advice i mean i know we just spent 90 minutes giving advice but anything left in the tank oh let me see oh yeah i still got some coffee left <laughs> that's good i got a tank of coffee today no <laughs> um yeah the only advice I, I can give you all is uh don't get caught may not